We're doing a couple of practice problems here. So the first one we're expanding. So using our properties of logarithms, the logarithm of a division is going to be the subtraction, the difference in the logarithms. And I'm going to rewrite this as to the one third power and write the square root as to the one half power. The logarithm of a multiplication, we can split up into the sum of the logarithm. So it's going to become this. And then we can use that third property of logarithms and bring the exponents out in front. And this is where we're trying to get. So this is our expansion. So we have kind of pulled that apart as much as we can. Second one, we're going the other direction. So the numbers that are multiplying the logarithms are going to become, are going to come into the logarithm as exponents. And so we'll get to this. And then there are the subtractions are going to become divisions. So we can put this into one logarithm. And both of the subtractions are going to end up as division. So they're both going to end up in the uh, denominator. And then we can rewrite these, if you can, as uh, in radical form. So 1 half is going to become a square root. And the v to the 4 fifths is going to become the fifth root of z to the 4. And again, it's condensed into a single logarithm. Yes? Up oh, three fifths. Yep. So then we'll change that one to a three. So that's the numerator. Does that look better? Okay. Other questions on that? Okay, let me give you another one that is kind of like this, and that you're going to have to use these properties of um, kind of decomposing uh, the logarithm in a different context. So let me give you one of these real quick. So we will say that uh, so the log of 2, we'll know the log of 2 is about 0 0.301. And we'll know that the log of 6 is about 0.778. So those are the approximations we're going to use. Can you find uh, the log without use of a calculator? Can you find an approximation for the log of 12? So you're going to have to think of how you can decompose 12 into things that are going to be multiplying, dividing uh, with 6 and 2, or possibly powers of 10. Does that make sense? Okay, let's get different people up to the board to do this. I'm going to pause this for a moment. So we are just going to break this into the log of 2 times 6, which becomes the log of 2 plus the log of 6. So this is a conceptual thing right here to use our properties of logarithms. Then we're told that uh, the log of 2 is 0 0.301, and the log of 6 is 0.778. When we add those, we're going to get a 1.079. Okay, so let's do the same idea, but this time let's do the log of 0.5. I'm trying to disguise this a little bit. Let's get a different group up to the board. See what you can do with that. I'm going to pause the video to do it. We've seen a few different ways of doing this. Uh, I think any, uh, any way you look at it, we want to think of that as one half. So 0.5 is a half. Now we can call that the log of 1 minus the log of 2. And now we need to know that the log of 1 is 0. And we're told that the log of 2 is 0 0.301. That might be the most direct way. Yet another way of thinking of this as being the log of 2 to the negative 1, which 1 half is. That's 2 to the negative 1. Then use our property of logarithms and say that's the negative of the log of 2. And that's going to get us also to the negative 0.301. Then we had a third way, and that was, tell me again what you did, Nora, that you said that the log of 5 is the log of 10 divided
divided by two, and then we can say that's the log of 10 minus the log of two. And so the log of 10, since that's a power of 10, the logarithm base 10 and an exponential base 10 cancel each other out in inverses. And then here's our, uh, what is it? That's 0.699. Then what did you do with that? Then you said that. Could you subtract the log of 10? So. But then it would get negative to the square. So how are you going to get from log 5 to, to this, I guess? Oh, we can think of that. How about uh, that's going to be 5 times 10 to the negative 1. And so then we can say, it's kind of a long roundabout way. Yeah. But we can do that. So here's our log of 5, 0.699. And now we're back to a log of uh, exponential from base 10. That's going to be a negative 1. And so if you subtract these, you're going to get 0 0.201. And you keep the sign of the bigger one, and you're going to be negative. That was a pretty roundabout way. Questions on that? Let's do one more. Do the log of 600. Come on up to the board, whichever turn it is. Okay, so we're deciding that this 600 is, we're going to think of as 6 times 100. That's going to become the log of 6 plus the log of 100. And so log of 6, we know is 0 0.778. And log of 100, we know is the log of 10 to the second. So logarithm base 10 and exponential base 10 cancel each other. We found this decimal arithmetic much more uh, user friendly and got to 2.77. Questions on any of these? Okay, how about um, the homework? Any of those you would like to see clarified? So maybe we should start with the last one, homework 38. Anything on that? that we want help on, then we'll go back and take questions from the review if there's questions on that. 38? How about the review? Any of those that were daunting? Twenty-five. Let me see if I manage here. Twenty-five. Yeah, this is a. We can have a class if we can get through our list and we can do some of these. So sound A that is thirty-two decibels, and sound B is louder. It's fifty-four decibels, and we want to know how many more times in print is sound B than sound A. And you're given the formula for decibels is going to be this uh, sound intensity of whatever it is we're uh, measuring divided by some minimal amount, I sub zero, which doesn't really matter to us. So the shortcut version, and I can explain why it is if, if you want to see it. The shortcut version we're saying is if you subtract those. So if we take the bigger one minus the smaller one, we're going to get 22. And then we can set that equal to our formula here, only because we're subtracting logarithms like we are there, that's going to become the logarithm of the sound intensity of the louder one divided by the sound intensity of the smaller one. So it's going to become 10 log of, and I'm just going to call this uh, I sub L for the louder one over I sub S for the softer one. And so this is what we're going to end up solving. So we can divide by the 10, and that's going to become 2.2. And then it's a logarithm of, again, the sound intensity of the louder one over the sound intensity of the softer one. And we can either go 10 to this power equal that, or imagine exponentiating both sides, base 10, however you want to conceptualize that. So we're going to get 10 to the 2.2 
is the sound intensity of the louder one over the sound intensity of the softer one. So if you multiply that softer one to the other side, what we're getting to is the sound intensity of the louder one is this many times louder than the softer one. And then when you plug that into your calculator, I think you get like 158 point something or whatever. Do you want to see how we get to here? Yeah. That gonna help? Okay, so um, the idea behind this when, so I'm gonna take that part out. So what we're getting is that that 54 is this formula when we plugged in the louder one. So the 54 came from 10 times the log of our louder sound over I sub zero minus the 32 came from taking the 10 times the logarithm of that softer sound over that I sub zero. So if we factor that 10 out of this right side of the equal sign, we get a difference in logarithm. So we're getting that log of the loud one over I sub zero minus the log of the soft one over I sub zero. That difference of two logarithms. And like we've been talking about here today, a difference in logarithms we can condense into a logarithm of the division. So this will become 10 times the log of, and now you have this horrible looking fraction. I've seen what you guys do with decimals. I can only imagine the horrors that this must lead to. <laughs> so uh, when you have a division of fractions, we're going to multiply by the reciprocal. And so the I sub zeros will cancel. And so this becomes 10 times the log of the louder one over the softer one. So I think it helps to see this and maybe write it out a couple times until it seems reasonable. And then you can, you're welcome to shortcut it then to kind of what I was suggesting earlier, subtract the decibels and that's going to become equal to 10 times the log of, and it becomes the louder one divided by the softer one. And then from here we can divide by 10 and exponentiate to get to that. Rory? Can you plug in the decimal value for each one, like in a different equation, and then solve for i for each of the equations, and then subtract the larger one from the smaller one? Yeah, the only thing you're going to get there, that's fine. I'm okay with that. You're going to get the i sub zero is still going to be there mm -hmm. until the end when you divide it out. But yeah, that would certainly be, that's correct mathematically. That would be totally okay. Okay. Yeah. Does that help? Other questions? Okay, well, let's talk about then, uh, we're talking about 6.2 here, which is a vertical stretch and shrink, which I think you've seen before in your algebra for two days, but I think it's worth reviewing. And then next time we're going to talk about the horizontal stretch and shrink, which is the one that uh, really I think uh, people find challenging. The vertical stretch and shrink, I think, is pretty intuitive, and the horizontal is not. So... This seems like it does what it should do. So I'm going to give you a made up function here. So we're going to say this function goes from negative one to one on both the X and the Y. This is the only place it's defined. It's going to look like this kind of loop above and then a loop above. So this is our function F of X. So if we then are interested in finding you know, what happens when you, and again, our book likes to call these outside transformations. What happens when you do something to this function where you're not messing around with the X, the thing that's inside the, the function, what's going into the function, but just what happens after something has come out of the function. And so in that case, the, our book likes to call it an outside transformation. So. What this is going to do is just take all of the old y values that we had for f of x. That's what this is. And you're going to multiply each of those by 2. The x values remain as they were before. So you're taking a look at that green function there. And each of these y values will get multiplied by 2. So then how tall will our graph go? 
and how low will it go? Negative two. Negative two. And so I think that's pretty intuitive. You know, when this number is bigger than one, then we would call that a vertical stretch. So this is going to now go up to two and down to negative two. And we're going to get all of the other y values in between are going to get multiplied by two. In particular, any place where it crosses the x-axis has a y value of zero, and multiplying that stays zero. So any x-intercept remains unchanged. And I think that's pretty reasonable. If we multiply this by a number that is smaller than one, say a half, then again, as we plug in the same x values that we had in the original, our domain remains the same, and each of those y values is going to mul get multiplied by a half, so they're all going to get become half as tall. So they will be half the distance from the x-axis that they were before, and so our highest value will now be a half, and our lowest value will be negative a half, and so every other y value also is multiplied by a half, and we call that a vertical shrink. So uh, let's just plot for a moment. What, what we can see also is in some of our known functions, our known graphs, these what we like to call parent functions, uh, most of the ones that we know are going to contain the point zero, 0, but also contain the point 1, 1. So in the case of y equals square root of x, 0, 0 is a point on there, and 1, 1 is a point on there. And it's going to be that top half of a sideways parabola. So we can, we can describe, now this is nonlinear. So this is not a straight line. So there is no slope of this line. And so even though we can say, you know, in this first point, as we look at going from 0, 0 to 1, 1, we can think of going up 1 and over 1. We can't do that any further, right? We can't also go up 1 and over 1 again and get a point on the curve. Like, that's not going to happen because you can see that uh, it's going to take, we're going to have to go all the way out to 4 before we get up to a y value of 2. So from 0, 0 to 1, 1, we went up 1 over 1. But then we had to go up 1 and over 3 more. And it's going to change as we go because this is not linear. It is not a straight line. There is no slope. But it is OK when we look at, say, the effect of a vertical stretch or shrink. And we're going to try to use this idea again tomorrow when we talk about horizontal stretch and shrink. You can do that for one point. That is, you can see what, where does the place start? Where's our starting point, zero, zero? You can get another point one time by thinking of going up two and over one. But you can't do it repeatedly, just as you can't do it repeatedly with the original function because it is not a straight line. So it is OK to graph this 2 squared of x to go up two and over one. And this will be a point, and you can see that. This is the point 1, 2 that we're talking about. And when we plug in 1 for x, the square root of 1 is 1 times 2 is 2. So the y value does become 2 in this transformed square root function. So it's still going to be that top half of a sideways parabola, but it's been stretched vertically. Similarly, if we look at y equals 1 half square root of x, only for the point, that first point after the, the starting point, after 0, 0. You know, we can still start at 0, 0. We can go, but now you have to be careful. We can't go up 1 over 2 like we would in the case of a straight line. We can't rise 1, run 2. We can only say what happens to that point 1, 1. So that means we're going to go up a half and then over 1. So we're going to go up with that vertical stretch is a half. And that's going to be the value of y when x is the 1 that in the original parent function generated the point 1, 1. Right? Because the square root of 1 is 1 times a half is a half. That's not the same as going up 1 over 2. So if you try to go up 1 over 2, 
the point 0.21 is not a point on this curve, right? Square root of 2, if you plug in 2, square root of 2 times a half is not 1. They're not equal to each other. So you have to be very cautious, very careful about how you use this idea. And it's going to get more complicated tomorrow when we add in the horizontal stretch and shrink. Is that okay? So interesting, too, is to see what happens to our rate of change. So if we look at the rate of change, say, between x equals, uh, well, let's say 0 and x equals 4, then in our original, and I'll try to match these with their colors so we can see, the rate of change on the original square root of x graph is we're going to take f, how do we find rate of change again? Ooh, I'm assuming fact's not in evidence here. What is it? Y2 minus y1. Yeah, so it's going to be y2 minus y1. It's just our slope formula over x2 minus x1. So give this down, not in this uh, familiar algebra 2 form, but use functional notation to say what's going to happen here. So we're going to try to up the level here, our sophistication in dealing with this. So instead of y2 minus y1, we can call this we could call it delta y over delta x, good. Uh, I'm still looking for functional mm -hmm. notation here. F of x. Yeah, so let's maybe we'll call this f of x. So we'll call this f of x here. Then we're going to get f of, how are we going to get that y sub 2? f of what? x2. And what is x2 in our case? Oh. Four. Four. Is that okay? Any nods of head. So I'm going to call that f of 4 minus f of, f of 0. And that's going to be over 4 minus 0. Four minus zero. Okay. Same idea, same algebra 2 idea, just writing it in functional notation. And so this is going to become, since our function is the square root of x, this is going to be square root of 4 minus 0 over 4 minus 0. Square root of 4 we know is. 2 and square root of 0 is 0, so we're going to have 2 over 4, which is 1 half. So our rate of change uh, on the original parent function, our rate of change is 1 half. Okay, so we're going to compare this now. What happens to that rate of change when we do this vertical stretch? Is the rate of change still going to be the same, or is it going to, is it going to somehow get stretched or shrunk as well? So visually what we're saying is our rate of change on the original parent function is the slope of that line joining those two points on the curve. So we call that a slope of a secant line. Okay, which is a, a pre-calculus topic. Next year we're going to talk about slopes of tangent lines. And we'll compare and contrast it with these. We'll talk about instantaneous rate of change rather than an average rate of change. Okay, looking at our 2 square root of x, we're still now, this is our new, uh, let's call it g of x. So now instead of calling that uh, f of x like we did before, so we can distinguish, we'll give it a new name, g, and finding the rate of change on that purple 2 square root of x function, we're still going to go g of 4 minus g of 0 over 4 minus 0. Okay, so in this case, and I'm going to write it out here, we're going to get 2 times the square root of 4 minus 2 times the square root of 0, still over 4 minus 0. I'm just going to call that 4 in the denominator. You with me here? So you can kind of see, I mean, if we look at this big picture, we could factor that 2 out of this whole thing. Right? I'm not going to do that, but we could factor that 2 out, and it would look 2 times the rate of change of the original. Does that make sense? So what's happening is our, when we do this vertical stretch on the function, it's going to multiply the rate, rate of change of the original by that same 2. So that rate of change is going to get multiplied as well. So again, square root of 2, 4 is 2, times 2 is 4. Minus 0 over 4 is going to be 1. Notice that is twice the rate of change of the other. So what's happening, the point is that what's happening here is this vertical stretch. As we multiply all of these y values by 2, 
it's making that thing steeper. It's making it grow faster. Does that make sense? That rate of change has been multiplied by whatever that vertical stretch is. And similarly, we're going to see, I'm going to call this h of x. So our rate of change for the blue function there, the one half squared of x, is going to be h of 4 minus h of 0 over 4 minus 0. So that's going to be 1 half squared of 4 minus 1 half squared of 0 over the 4 minus 0. And again, the square root of 4 is 2 times a half becomes 1. And minus 0 over 4, we're getting half of that original rate of change. So whatever we multiply that by that vertical stretch is uh, multiplying the rate of change by that same thing. And visually, you can see that, that when we stretch this curve, it makes that thing steeper. And when you uh, shrink that thing, it makes it flatter. Okay, so let's do some combinations of these where we can do our translations together with our uh, stretches and shrinks on my board here. Let me do, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit because I think some of the later stuff is harder and I think we have less experience here. So I'm going to talk about tables here. So I'm going to give a new uh, function this time. So we're going away from the graph. So no longer are we going to reference that graph that had the little loop above, loop below. Instead, this function is going to be defined, as far as we know, only at negative 2, negative 1, 1, and 2. These are the only values for which we're going to know what f is. And its values are going to be 5, 3, 0, negative 3, negative 5. So there's our numerical representation of our function f of x. And so can we make a table? So can we make a table for, we're going to say, uh, g of x, which is going to be equal to, uh, can I make a big jump? Can we do, let's do a uh, negative 2f of, I think we'll just, uh, let's go f of x minus 1. So we're going to, this may be a little too much to try right away, but we'll, see if we can fight our way through it. So we'll see a difference kind of in how we approach this based on a change that's inside that function, what's happening to the x, versus a change that's outside the function, the multiplying by negative 2. So the, the inside part is we have to decide what are the values of x that we're going to use so that after all of these transformations occur, we end up with these values of x because these are the only place we can evaluate f. If we plug in the wrong choice, if I plug in a negative 2 here for x, then I'm going to have to do this transformation first. Negative 2 minus 1 is negative 3. Then I'm forced to evaluate f of negative 3, but there is no f of negative 3. That's not in the domain of f. I can't evaluate that. Since there is no place to evaluate f of negative 3, that means the value of x that I picked here is not going to be in the domain of g. It's not going to give us something that we know. And so I can't use negative 3. It's not going to, it's not defined there. Does that make sense? So you have to, in a sense, think, well, what, what are we going to pick for x here that's going to give us this value there? And whether you're doing this in your head or when it gets more complicated, like it's going to in the next day or two, we could say what value of x is going to make x minus 1 equal to negative 2. So that's the question either that's going in your head without writing it down, or like we say, if it's, when it gets real complicated, this is how we're going to resolve this. And so that means what we want is to choose x to be negative 1. So that smallest value in the domain of g is going to be negative 1. Because when we plug in negative 1 for x, we have to, before we go into the function f to evaluate it, we have to do whatever it's telling us to do inside there. So we take that negative 1, subtract 1, and get negative 2. What we actually evaluate in f then is negative 2. And that we can evaluate because it is in the domain of f. It's saying that f of negative 2 is 5. Now, that's, this part right here has become 5. Now we deal with this stuff that's the kind of outside transformation stuff. Once it has gone through the function f and been evaluated, 
Now we deal with whatever may be outside of that function. In this case, it's going to get multiplied by negative 2, and so we're going to get negative 10. Does that make sense a little bit? Okay, so you fill out the rest of the table, and then we'll compare and see if we get the same results. Say, do you want to give it a shot? What's the, give me the next one. What's the next one going to be? Um, exactly. Because you plug in 0. 0 minus 1 is negative 1. F of negative 1 is 3. 3 times negative 2 is negative 6. Is that okay? Emma, what would you get for the next one? Okay, we'll fight your way through it now. What would it be? Okay, well, hold on. Well, first, what's the x value you're going to use? One. And when you plug in one, you're going to get one minus one is zero. So in f, you're going to evaluate f of zero. Okay. Claire, you got the next one. What do you think? Okay. Well, talk me through it. What are you going to plug in for f? Actually, I like the x minus 1 equals 1. Then where did you go with there? X equals 2. X oh, equals yeah, 2. Okay, that I like. Okay. Yeah. And f of 2, you said, was? Um, <coughs> Wait, did we do that right? Two, two, three. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yep. And then I got 6. And you got... Uh, yes. Okay. And what does that make the last point, Grace? Good. And what's that going to give us? I'm not sure what the last point is. Oh, no, let's see. The, X is, the value of uh, X is 3. So we're going to take 3 here first. That's where we're plugging in the X. Oh, right. Uh, negative. Okay. Let me change up the question a little bit here. So I got three minutes. So I'm going to say P of X has domain uh, negative four less than or equal to N, or I'm going to call it P of N. P of N, domain negative four less than or equal to N, strictly less, less than six. And its range is going to be negative 10 less than or equal to y or p of n, whatever you want to call it, and strictly less than n. So find a possible uh, <coughs> expression with p of n. So we say y, uh, a possible, I'm going to say p of n, if this new domain and range for this new function is going to be some <coughs> transformation of p of n. You may have to multiply or add or subtract things either inside or outside the function to create a domain that's going to be <coughs> four and less than or equal to n, strictly less than six. Oh, let me change that. Let's go, I want to make it more interesting than that. Let's go, uh, let's say negative six less than n, less than or equal to four, and the range will be negative four less than p of n, less than or equal to 5. So the idea is what happens inside here uh, has to happen first. So inside here, to get this to be what we want, we can see that we've switched the order of these inequalities, right? This had the or equal to, now it's over here. And this had the strict inequality, now it's over there. So how did we have to do that? It has to be a negative. So we had a negative n that was 
that was in there where the domain was. And then to solve that, we multiplied through by negative one. And we can rewrite the order to get that domain. So this is going to have to be a P of negative n. To get to here, what did we do? We divide everything by 2 and multiply by n. And so this is going to change that range by making it half as much. We'll talk more about these. These are going to get um, challenging.